Well, I was going to start this panel by saying that I feel um, I feel a little awkward about um, introducing Marshall Talens because um, uh, this is his hometown, this is his place, and it would have been more appropriate in some way um, uh, not for me to introduce Marshall Talens to you, uh, but to introduce you to Marshall Talens. Uh, now it's doubly awkward because Marshall Talens isn't here because he isn't feeling very well today. Um, and will uh, have his paper instead read by Michael Silverstein, which is um, appropriate in a sense because uh, Marshall is the Charles F. Gray Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Anthropology, and Michael is the Distinguished Service Charles F. Gray Distinguished Service Professor today. Um, 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 I'm not sure whether it, I should say a great deal more about uh, Marshall Salen, since I think everybody does know him. Um, he, is, he is the anthropologist who has probably done more than anybody else to bring history and anthropology together. Um, he's a towering figure in um, uh, cultural anthropology. <coughs> yeah, um, we're very proud of him at, uh, to have him here at the University of Chicago. Uh, he has a remarkable talent for coming up with terms that stick, like um, like um, the original affluent society and develop man, a particular favorite. Um, he has, is a prolific scholar. Everybody knows that. We've all read um, a lot by uh, Marshall Silence. He won the Lane Prize twice, uh, the prize that the University of Chicago Press gives to faculty for books published uh, by the press that bring particular distinction to the press for culture and practical reason and for how natives think about Captain Cook, for example. And um, um, he um, has um, um, a very sharp wit um, and a very great sense of humor that shows itself in shorter writings like uh, Waiting for Foucault, which I recommend highly to everybody. It's out in a new version called Waiting for Foucault Still. <laughs> um, but we are short of time, so without further ado, I will ask Michael Silverstein, please, to impersonate Marshall Thales for you. The title of the paper is um, um, The Anthropology of the Marvelous, um, um, the History and Anthropology. The historiography and anthropology of the marvelous, uh, Stranger, Stranger Kings, Kings, for example, uh, by Marshall Solomon. Um, the ancient Greeks had good reason to deify memory, commenting on cosmogonic myths in Homer and Hesiod. Uh, Jean uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Vernon notes that the quote the past thus revealed represents much more than the time prior to the present. It is it is the very source unquote. Anthropologists are familiar with many institutional forms of a temporality that thus embeds the present in a distant past. The dream time of native Australians, the kinship eye of the Maori, the positional succession of the Lunda, the installation rituals by which the Shiluk king becomes the immigrant founder of the dynasty, Nikang. Here the past functions paradigmatically, not just syntagmatically if with all the differences implicitly conveyed in analogy. Yet something more is at issue than the conflation of past and present, namely the future. Insofar as we thus know being as becoming, this sense of the past as a continuing source is also a destiny. Even where the complexities of tradition and the privileges of power offer opportunities of, for choice and interest, the contingency unfo itself unfolds in cultural terms that pre-exist and transcend it. What actually happened is culturally recuperated, which is how it becomes a, an historical cause. Memory, mother of the muses, quote, reveals what has been and what will be, um, in, uh, uh, unquote, in Vernon. A collective immortal, uh, immortal virtually by definition, memory has the power of ordering human existence. The origin stories of immigrant kings, such as Nikon, likewise have powers for making history by being history. I will focus on these stranger king traditions with a view toward contrasting the ways that historians and anthropologists usually know their so-called mythical dimensions. What is irrelevant fable for historians is often historical truth for anthropologists, inasmuch as the modes of historical production are culturally relative. The stranger kingdom is the dominant form of the pre-modern state. 
The rulers of a remarkable number of societies around the planet have been strangers by dynastic origin and ethnic identity to the people they rule. As rehearsed in ongoing traditions and enacted in royal rituals, the kings come from elsewhere, typically from some exalted place, whether terrestrial <coughs> kingdom or celestial homeland of gods. Incarnating the cosmic powers of their external origins, the ruler's foreign identity is perpetual, even as this structure of the polity is inherently temporal, based on the imposition of a civilizing a ruling group upon a relatively uncultured native population. Accordingly, the memory of the advent of the stranger prince is a condition of the possibility of the society as constituted, not simply, one might add, as an ideological justification of power, but as an active principle of structure. Although a marked capacity for violence on the part of the stranger prince is almost always an element of the charter tradition, the formation of the kingdom by conquest is an overrated notion. Just as the Israelites who wanted a king like other nations, although God warned they would be sorry, the indigenous people may have reasons of their own for peacefully incorporating and domesticating the powerful stranger. Conflict or no, contract is the normal mode of kingdom formation. The marriage of, an, of the immigrant prince with a daughter of the indigenous leader, thus giving rise to a dynasty that combines the ancestral powers of the people over the earth with, a transcendent, with, with the transcendent potencies of external spiritual realms. The effect is a dual polity of autochthonous, quote, owners, unquote, and foreign rulers, reserving a certain residual sovereignty to the owners by which they confer legitimacy on the rulers. The native headmen are kingmakers. They control the royal installation rituals, even as they retain priestly powers over the territory. While tributary to their stranger kings, the native people generally maintain control of the means of subsistence production in an economy that is likewise a dual, where the aristocracy is oriented rather toward um, alterity and the mobile riches uh, there acquired in raid and trade. Moreover, given that the alien status of the ruling aristocracy is a condition of its potency, the polity as a whole is often nominally and ethnically identified with the indigenous people. As set forth in the founding narratives, the native people and foreign rulers in the end encompass one another, hence the duality of sovereignty and society. With allowance for its necessary brevity and inevitable typifications, this description will hold for many stranger kingdoms, great and small. Among the better known ones, Majabahit, Fudan, Angkor, Pagan, Ayutthaya, Malacca, Gupta, Aztec, Inca, Maya, Dahme, Ashanti, Benin, Azande, Nyoro Kitara, Buganda, Alor, Lunda, Mali, Congo, Amorite, Hittite, Seleucid, Achmenid, um, Sparta, Klung, uh, Klung Kong, Atoni, Bao, Rewa, etc., etc., to the nth power. In the matter of historiography, the traditions of stranger king origins may have more or less support from documentary evidence. In the many instances of successive foreign dynasties in the same society, serial stranger king kingship, the older kingdom may be traditional by documentation and the more recent one archival, giving an overall effect something like an historical metaphor of a <coughs> mythical reality. The West African realm of ancient memory, established by the legendary conquering hero Suede in the um, country of his um, Nupe uh, maternal kin, was essentially duplicated in, by the 19th century Fulani conquest as ruled by one Masaba, whose maternal kin, among whom he was raised, were likewise Nupe. Commenting on the ethnographer, uh, com commented the ethnographer S.F. Nadel, quote, the twofold process of expansion over alien groups and culture, combined with cultural assimilation and absorption, is reflected in both in the ideological history of the Tsuede myth, as well as the real history of the Fulani kingdom." Unquote. As Mark Twain is reputed to have observed, uh, observed, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Critical for the present purposes, are the many instances in which stranger kingship um, develops as a structure without an event, 
without what Nadell would, have, uh, would call a real history, as where local notables take on the identities and trappings of greater outside rulers. Famous in anthropology are the hinterland Kachin chiefs who become Shan. Similarly, certain Gaulish leaders claimed Julian or Augustan descent, as likewise some powerful barbarian chiefs in the southern Chinese borderlands appropriated Han his ancestry. Like the sultans of Bornu, several West African rulers traced their origins to Mecca and Muhammad, while um, their still pagan rivals, such as the Borgu kings, countered with descent from the prophet's reputed Arabian enemy, Kisira. A number of Southeast Asian dentists became avatars of um, Shiva, Vishnu, or Brahma, while in the Islamic period, several Malay sultans took their genealogies back to Alexander the Great in his Quranic persona, Iskandar de Zulkarnain. Odysseus and other Nostoi were appropriated for um, kingdom founders by a number of Mediterranean states in antiquity. Aeneas of Troy also had a brilliant career as a dynastic ancestor from, uh, in Europe, from the original Roman kings to the Habsburgs by way of the Holy Roman emperors. And I haven't added many monarchs around the world whose ancestors descended from the heavens. Always a good address for persons with royal ambitions. I say these traditions are critical because they have been clearly made societies and histories, um, although they are not themselves, quote, historical, unquote. Understandably, they are easily dismissed by most historians as unbelievable. All the same, they could well be considered a real politics of the marvelous, for it is not quite true that these are structures without an event. They reflect the common fact that the societies in question have been embedded in larger geopolitical regimes of power, including empires with cosmocratic ambitions, as well as religions of equal scope. Many are external principalities of galactic polities or segmentary states. However, the real politics in question is not simply the colonial imposition of the dominant kinship on an indigenous people. The subject's own agency is at least as significant. In a common competitive process, something like Batesonian schismogenesis, ambitious chiefs are known to trump their internal rivals by allying themselves politically and symbolically with greater outside rulers. Transcending in this way the local system of authority, they develop a certain upward mobility, a political order foreign to and indeed beyond the generative capacity of the indigenous society itself. Descended from Alexander the Great via the, via the ancient kingdom of um, uh, uh, Srivijaya, Malacca in the 15th century headed all over the rival state of Malayu Jambi while maintaining unrivaled commercial relations with China and uh, um, Constantinople, Rome, as it were. But then the Minenkabao successors of Mela uh, Melayu Jambi in the 18th century, as kings of kings and privileged descendants of Adam, claimed superiority to their brothers, brother emperors of China and Rome. Contrast, uh, considered by contrast, a real positivist history of stranger kinship, king kingship, such as John Thornton's um, origin and early history of the Kingdom of the Congo, uh, circa 1350 to 1550, published in 2004. So real that the foreign status of the dynasty and the dual system of the society disappear for lack of confirmation in what the author considers primary sources. The people's own narratives of the advent of the dynastic founder, uh, Ntinu Wene, aka Lukeni Animi, are not recounted except for certain incidents that are written off as, quote, ideology, or worse, quote, cosmology, since in any case, Thornton decides that Ntinu Wene's father was the real founder and the king kingship was really endogenous. The historian does allow that the canonical European sources have um, been recording Congo traditions of the foreign origin of the dynasty for centuries, including the claims of 16th century kings that their original homeland was across the Congo River in the principality of Vungu. The major exception is the primary source on which Thornton places the most reliance, the 1591 account by Filippo uh, Pigafetta um, on the lost history of, of Duarte Lopez, a text which rather disqualifies itself by the assertion that, quote, they keep no histories of their ancient kings, nor any memorial of the ages past, because they cannot write, unquote. Yet as Georges Belandier noted, 
All the traditions collected by the chroniclers are in agreement that, as Paul Manso puts it, the nation of the Mashi Congo, the king of the Congo, was regarded as foreign. Along with fellow anthropologists Kaisa Ekholm and Jan van Sina, Ballandier describes a classic dual polity of the kind, as they all observe, widely known throughout the continent. A structure here narrated as the imposition of a foreign prince upon an indigenous population of Ambundu and other peoples by means of a series of violent and peaceful relations, martial and marital, culminating, however, in the cure of the sick hero by an important native ruler, by which means the latter and his successors confirm their perpetual status of elder or grandfather, mother's father of the kingship, mutual encompassment. Thornton dismisses the charter traditions of the Congo kingship because of, quote, the difficult problem of linking the secondary elements of tradition, like the narrative origin story, to documented reality, unquote. This is like saying that for lack of any link to documented reality, we should have to eliminate the crucifixion of Jesus, let alone his resurrection, from an account of the nature and history of Christianity. Ironically, the particular fault Thornton finds with Congo narratives, namely that they are only interpretative histories incorporating secondary explanatory narrative, is a good description of how he provides alternative interpretations that purportedly reveal the historical realities by means of his own native common sense explanations. The effect is to dissolve the indigenous motivations in an acid bath of ethnocentric banalities. There is, <laughs> speaking of bon mot, um, <laughs> there is, you can take that down, right? Dissolve the indigenous motivations in an acid bath of ethnocentric banalities. There is time for only one example. Thornton's deconstruction of the classic element in the foundation story where Ntino Wene kills his pregnant aunt when she refuses refused to pay the customary toll at a river crossing. Committed on the way to claiming his kingdom, this crime against kinship, kinship, which indeed infuriates Wene's father, is taken by his followers as the sign that he is a true chief. For as Luc de Heusch and others have noted, such draconian exploits, including such as fratricide, parricide, and incest, by their demonstrations of power above and beyond society, testify to the hero's capacity to reorganize it. Belandier writes, quote, This defiance of the fundamental principles of society is the mark of an exceptional being. Sacred violence remains the privilege of the sovereign with two faces, one brutal and tyrannical, the other justice-loving and conciliatory. Uh, unquote, uh, agamben avant la lettre, as it were. In contrast, Thornton counters the pertinent observation of an early uh, chronicler that the Bakongo admired Ntino Wene's bloodthirstiness by a feckless analogy instead to a well-known story of the Congo Christian King Alfonso, who had his idolatrous mother killed, quote, for the sake of the faith, unquote. In what amounts to a secondary explana explanatory narrative with the ethnocentric quality of his own common sense, Thornton opines that both royal exploits were legitimating signs of a, um, quote, ruler who upholds the law, unquote, which is rather the opposite of what they were doing. In any case, neither story could be true, Thornton opines, and the Wene tradition in particular is, quote, a tale we must not take too seriously given its ideological significance, unquote. Not serious? On the contrary, sacred violence is an essential structural element of Congo stranger king kingship. Calling its charter representation ideological is a way of disregarding it a priori, from which follows the anti-anthropological conclusion that what the people thus take seriously, we must not. Thornton's problem seems to be that he quixotically tries to make an event history out of a paradigmatic one. To conclude, a problem for historians and anthropologists both is the sense of the fictional inscribed in the notion of, quote, myth, unquote. Even the notion of mythical charter developed by Malinowski is an ethnological contradiction in terms, since the narratives that thus function as the constitution of the society can be no mere fiction, not in that society. On the contrary, the founding traditions convey a certainty at once empirical and tautological for as realized in all manner of customary practices from production to piety, 
They are continuously confirmed by the experience of the cultural schemes they explain and whose future they chart. Nor is this a mere matter of belief. In his remarkable analysis of historical concepts of, in the stranger kingdom of the Luapululunda, Ian Cunison wrote, quote, the important thing is this, what the Luapulu um, as people say about the past is what they know happened in the past. Simply to say they believed it happened is too weak, for they do not doubt it, unquote. Similarly, Meyer Fortis observed that when the Tolensi speak of cleavages between their Namu chiefs by ancestry foreigners from the Mamprusi kingdom, they trace them to myths of origin laid down with a finality of conviction that makes any question of their historical truthfulness irrelevant. I argue in a moment that such truth is not irrelevant, but in any case, one can say with Jean Pouillon, it's, uh, quote, it's only the non-believer who believes that the believers believe, unquote. Given this anthropological appreciation of the native's point of view, a certain contretemps uh, often develops between practitioners of the discipline and historians in, in regard to the conceptual value of the so-called myths of stranger kingship. The anthropologist, of course, knows what the people's truth is, un uh, is unlikely to be that of an historian in quest of, quote, what actually happened, unquote. Yet all the same, it is the people who make their history in every sense of the term. Not to take the extreme position of Edmund Leach, for example, who considers it irrelevant that Jesus's existence cannot be factually documented, since the historically relevant fact is what people believe about him. For even apart from the difference between believing and knowing, the differences between the people's accounts and the historian's empirical record are critical for understanding how what actually happens is culturally construed, which is never the only way possible. What such differences reveal are the cultural values that shape an historical course in the society at issue. The interesting question thus becomes, not what happened, but what it is that happened. It follows as a general rule, though increasingly subject to exceptions as their disciplines come closer together, that for anthropologists, the means ends relation between mythical narratives and archival reconstructions are the reverse of what they are for historians. For historians, myths are more or less valuable means of determining the real historical events, providing their fantastic aspects are debunked and discarded. The object is to find the kernel of truth in an otherwise unbelievable narrative upon which the rest of it is best ignored. Or else, as in the case of fabulous traditions of stranger king origins, the narrative is written off as a counterfeit claim of legitimacy. But for anthropologists, the actual historical events become the means for determining the operative principles of historical action, insofar as these events can then be compared in the ways they are presented in the people's traditions, thus culturally appropriated. Methodologically, historians work from the tradition or myth to the event by a process of rational abstraction, supposing historical truth is factual, whereas anthropologists work from the event or fact to the tradition by a process of exegetical elaboration, supposing that cultural truth is historical. May they finally get together on the principle that vox populi vox historia. <laughs> I think we're yeah. yeah.